Thanks very much. Just for the purposes of clarity, I'm Tina McGuinness and that's Rob March, and just in case there's any confusion. Uh, but very, thanks very much for coming along this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about the use of social media in UK higher education. A conversation with Deep a minute ago and I was saying well we've kind of come into social media almost sideways because we're interested in issues around organizational disruption and business continuity management and one of the issues that emerged was looking at business continuity management it's actually a very under-researched area as a management process and we're based in a management school a lot of the research the far majority of research in terms of crisis and emergency is interdisciplinary, largely social science, engineering and so forth. There's actually been relatively little empirical work done from a management point of view. So hopefully this, this, makes, this makes for an interesting perspective that we'll bring to, your, uh, to the presentation this morning. What I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is going to explain kind of the conceptual basis and the context within which this small study took place. It took place in 2011. And it was really, we, what we wanted to do was to gather some empirical data. Because if you read about management practice in UK higher education, there's very little in the UK and there's extremely little elsewhere as well. In terms of the use of social media in crisis communications within the educational context, there's even less. And in fact, one of the few studies we were able to track down was by Barbara Ganey in the United States, who was actually looking at social media in public schools, public school districts. So we're going to talk about some of the context, some of the conceptual kind of basis uh, for our work um, and talk about the methods in terms of the data collection and some findings. It is a small study and it's meant very much as a pilot to try and explore some of these issues a little more in terms of UK higher education, business continuity and emergency response and also within the wider framework of risk management and that's where we're taking this in the longer term. Well, let's start off by talking about higher education within the UK context and why it's actually worthwhile looking at this. There's been a huge amount of change in UK higher education over the past number of years. We have increasing marketisation of the higher education sector, um, driven by a number of different imperatives, a number of different drivers, government policy, the globalisation of um, education, and the consumerization of education as well. However, within the UK, go on ahead. the UK higher education sector is actually a very powerful driver for the UK economy. And one indicative uh, a statistic for that is the amount of revenue <coughs> that it actually uh, creates. Uh, UK higher education accounted for £23 billion pounds in 2010-11, and that's growing year on year. Now, of that revenue, approximately 34% of that is accounted for by student fee income. So these processes of marketization, this process of the consumerization of education, where students are increasingly treating education as uh, 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 something to be consumed and evaluated in a very different way than, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago, mean that the competitive landscape for U UK higher education is increasing and increasing. We also have other changes such as recently uh, the ability of educational institutions to charge up to £9,000 in student fees per year. And these are all feeding into a higher level of discernment by key consumers of education, namely students and if you like their co-consumers very often, their parents who are helping in terms of, in terms of providing some uh, uh, financial as well as moral support to their, to, their, to their children. So increasingly then we see institutional brand and institutional reputation gaining greater importance. It's becoming a key tool in terms of the recruitment um, of students to universities as universities compete within a more competitive UK pool for students but also within a global pool with overseas students accounting for a significant amount of university revenues. But despite all this, universities actually remain very ill-prepared in terms of how they have thought about the potential for threats, the potential for disruptions, and what that might mean for their ability to, con to continue with their day-to-day -day activities, to protect their key stakeholders in terms of delivering the um, product, if you like, of education, lectures, seminars, and so forth. 
um, and how they might respond to some of the threats that might face them. If we look in terms of the kinds of things that universities have had to face in terms of threats and disruptions, we can see, obviously, the big kind of um, picture grabbers are those issues around gunmen shooting, uh, particularly in US campuses. But within the UK context, one big issue that's emerged over the past number of years has been in terms of visas and students being able to get visas, students being able to um, enter UK universities. And in fact, this has created major disruption for London Met University, who had their uh, license revoked, which impeded their ability to recruit students as well as to service students they'd already recruited. And indeed, the University of Wales ceased to exist at the behest of the UK government because of a visa scam. So there's a range of different uh, potential threats that can impact upon UK higher education institutions. When we talk about business continuity, just for the purposes of clarity, what I'm talking about is very much from a management and business perspective. So business continuity management is a management process that identifies threats to an organization and provides the potential to enhance organiza organizational resilience through developing resources, capabilities, and risk mitigation. And what we see here is this notion of an holistic kind of process where a business continuity plan is established based upon identifying what the critical activities for the organization are, what needs to be protected, what kind of risk mitigation might take place, what kind of business continuity processes and plans might be needed and implemented, the monitoring and review of those processes, structures and resources in a regular view, and a virtuous circle of enhancement. Obviously, in terms of activation, or as we might term it more broadly, emergency response, operation of the business continuity plan comes into effect whenever there is a threat or potential disruption. And typically, there are different levels at which different types of plans will be activated. I think what's also worth mentioning here is in terms of interested parties, because this really brings us to the heart of effective emergency response, effective business continuity management, which is one that is based upon an understanding of who the stakeholders of an organization are. And when we were talking or thinking about stakeholders within that, this context, there's an enormous literature in terms of stakeholders and stakeholder management. And we really adopted Robert E. Freeman's approach to characterizing stakeholders as those who directly impact or are affected by the organization's purpose. And if we think about that, well, then stakeholders clearly are a key stakeholder for a university, okay? And disruptions potentially impact upon them and a range of other institutional stakeholders within the university, outside of the university. But what's interesting and one of the things that presents particular problems for organisations in crisis where they have to uh, implement their contingency measures or their business continuity management is that different stakeholders may require different response. And that can create a level of complexity and a level of resource stretch within an institution that can create particular challenges for it. And stakeholders can actually be a very effective mechanism or a very effective tool to actually reduce or to dampen down the impacts of crisis. Equally, failure to effectively manage and to respond to stakeholders' concerns, stakeholders' needs, can serve to escalate crisis within an organization. So stakeholders really lie at the heart of organizational survival and longer term organizational success. Within that then, beyond just thinking about what the stakes are for stakeholders, it's also necessary to think about how best to communicate to stakeholders during a time of crisis. And there's, again, there's a wide range of literature from a number of different disciplinary perspectives. But two key things really I'd like to emphasize for the purpose of our presentation, which is firstly that the choice of media, the mechanisms, the tools by which you actually seek to communicate with stakeholders need to be appropriate to the stakeholder group that you're trying to communicate with. Now that may seem very obvious, but it is very often the first hurdle at which organizations can fall. Second issue is that there needs to be consistency in terms of the messages coming out from the organization. Consistency in terms of the information that the organization is providing. 
and that those messages should also be appropriate to the type of media uh, that's being used by the organization. If there's inconsistency, contradictory messages, what happens then is that there is an erosion, a reduction in terms of the credibility and trust between the organization and the particular stakeholder group. For universities, uh, obviously they have a very young demographic in terms of, if you like, their customer group. And indeed, in terms of the uptake of social media, 18 to 34 year olds are by far the most, uh, uh, the demographic that uses social media the most. I think there's, there was some data a couple of years ago that in the 18 to 34 group, uh, members of Facebook, 48% of members of Facebook checked Facebook first thing in the morning. A significant majority, majority of Twitter users actually check Twitter before they even get out of bed in the morning. So there's a very different context in terms of the sources and the media that this key demographic uses. If we try to think about that in terms of the context of crisis communications, then we can see that social media actually offers significant benefits to institutions who are trying to respond to a crisis or a threat. It facilitates faster decision making and the ability to expedite those decisions through the use of social media. It also facilitates knowledge sharing. Very importantly as well, it provides a potential for dialogic communication. Rather than merely one way or unidirectional communication, social media allows a communication process whereby there is a feedback loop back to the institution in terms of what stakeholder perceptions are what the impact of the messages and the information they're sending out to the stakeholder group is, and the potential, therefore, to refine and enhance their communication processes and their messages based upon that. However, the downside of that is there's been some concerns that actually social media may, in fact, act as an amplifying tool in terms of crisis. That what is, in essence, a local issue, a minor local issue, can very quickly through the movement, through social media, through social media and social media sites, become a much larger issue. So this social amplification of a particular risk. And indeed, that's a key issue that we'll pick up later in terms of some of the findings of the, of the study. Thank you, Tina. So we took this literature review and this background to consider how the application of social media might be relevant to crisis management in uh, UK universities. And this was a novel area of research at the time of writing. We, um, as Tina mentioned, there was very little to be found about the use of social media in higher education at all. There was some consideration in America to an extent, but nothing applied to the United Kingdom. So we felt this me meant that we needed to take an exploratory case study approach to understand what the constructs were, what the norms and understandings of this area were within the United Kingdom and what the boundaries were for future study. In doing that, we took a qualitative approach um, instead of trying to quantify what the uh, prevalence of this uh, was in the United Kingdom. We used interviews and focus groups as a way to capture the current state of affairs and look at what the current knowledge and application was. Um, so the first approach that we used was a focus group interviews with students. This was a, this was a summer based project so we were limited in our, our student groups that we could uh, work with. So it was a predominantly PGR and PGT, so that postgraduate research and taught students. Um, at master's and PhD level students in the United Kingdom, which does um, admittedly leave a limitation in the current application of this research, but gives us an initial insight into the field. And then the second was semi-structured interviews uh, directly with business continuity managers within different higher education institutions. So the focus groups uh, were deliberately uh, chosen for the student perspective as the communication media um, with students tends to be from the single entity, the university, to a large group of students. Um, although there is an argument that social media allows a much more one-to-one -one, uh, and two-way communication process to be uh, undertaken, uh, our understanding was actually, a lot of the time, that this was actually going in a one-to-many perspective. And so the focus group design allowed us to reflect this one-to-many process. 
that students were experiencing in their time with UK universities. Um, we took uh, sort of three different strands within the focus group. We had some direct questions. What would you feel in this situation? What would you do? And some group discussion to encourage the different attitudes of different student groups to come out. And, um, and some scenario responses. So in the scenario responses, we started to explore ideas of severity and of time criticality. So the first scenario we put to the students was, it's snowing and you've got a lecture tomorrow morning. How would you expect? What would you expect the university to do to communicate this issue with you? Where would you go to find out about this information? The second scenario looked at flu pandemic. Um, OK, the flu, 10 students in your class have got flu but 10 students in another class have got flu. There's a clearly a sign that flu is becoming more important. And this was a, based on a genuine uh, fear uh, problem, if you like, in the early 2000s in UK universities. How would you expect universities to communicate with you in this situation? It's a different time frame. It's potentially bubbling up over a longer period. Uh, you know, does this change how you would expect universities to talk to you? And then the final one was based on um, the increasingly uh, common university mass shootings which have been taking place in America but this was particularly grown out of the Vir Virginia Tech scenario where we took the students through stage by stage the timeline of what happened in Virginia Tech from the initial shooting and then introducing well actually the police got the uh, reports about this initial shooting two hours before the university told the students anything does this change how you feel should the university have told you more quickly or are they correct to hold back information until they have a more full picture and we audio and video recorded the focus groups. Um, the reason being that we were intrigued. I didn't want to lose any data, if you like. So the audio recording would allow us to hear what people said, but the video recording was looking for any facial reactions, any interactions between group members. Ultimately, it didn't prove to add that much to the data collection, but we didn't want to miss it at the initial point of collection. Um, in the interviews, these were one-to-one -one interviews um, with uh, members of the UK Higher Education Business Continuity Network, or HEBCON. Um, they were recruited um, through uh, the head of this network who put us in contact with a number of people. And we undertook face-to-face -face or telephone interviews. Um, the practicality of the fact that these people were based all over the UK and we had a two- to three-month period to actually do this entire piece of work meant that the majority of interviews were taken via telephone. Um, but we did do two, um, which were on a face-to-face -face basis. The interviews took between one and a half and just over three hours and um, were subsequently transcribed for um, template analysis. And the interviews started to explore the university's business continuity practices, how they uh, planned for, or did they plan, what was their understanding of the business continuity lifestyle life cycle. Were they trying to work for accreditation to the then British standard on business continuity management, which has now been superseded by an international standard? We, for this purpose of this presentation, we were, we're focusing on the, da um, the data on developing and implementing a response to crisis management and how the universities plan to use or do use social media. Once again, they were audio recorded and transcribed, and they were template analysed using NVivo. So if we go on to the findings, in this situation, uh, only 28% of the participants of the focus group actually had a smartphone, which was uh, below the uh, one UK university's published average of 56% students having a smartphone, and, the, and it also below the UK national average of 35%. So do bear this in mind with some of the research findings. But what we did find was that the students, for communicating amongst themselves, had a strong preference for internet-based communication. They used Facebook, they used email, they were on Web 2.0 media. Everyone exclusively was on Facebook. We, used, we had different groups of students, one of which was predominantly international students, and they mentioned that they, their use of Facebook had actually increased since coming to the United Kingdom as a means uh, to communicate back home, and equally that's why they got involved with Skype. But actually, Twitter was incredibly uncommon amongst this user group, uh, with only two out of the uh, focus group members actually being on Twitter. 
And the theme that kept coming through through all the focus groups was that social media was for engagement with friends. It was not a place that they wanted to interact with the university. They did, there were concerns that the university would see what they were up to on a Friday night, that, that they would find out information about themselves that wasn't for sharing with an educational institution. And as this quote says, I wouldn't like to receive any information from the university via Facebook because <coughs> Facebook is more for friends. However, this attitude towards um, different social media and different modern technologies of communication changed according to the severity of the, influ uh, of the uh, scenarios that we are placing in front of them. So in the shooting scenario, I've called this face-to-face -face communication, but what really was came out was a number of groups said we would expect the building management, the porters, to come and talk to us and tell us, stay in this room or go to this safe place. They didn't want to be getting emails. And I think this is reflected by the fact that so few of them had a smartphone, but one participant said, email is an insane way of doing it. Most people just don't have smartphones. We want someone to come and tell us where is safe and what is safe. When there is no time criticality, however, an email was preferred. So in the lecture, um, the night before lecture cancellation because of snow, an email was expected. In terms of pandemic flu, if this was a building problem in terms of you shouldn't be coming to lectures or start considering going to the GP to get checked, once again, they felt email was an acceptable and a, a normal way of, uh, of uh, going about it. But if the lecture cancellation moved to the morning um, of the day of the lecture, then they felt that a actually a text message would be an appropriate method to uh, be responded to. One thing that came across both the student and the practitioner findings was this need for reciprocal trust. Students said that the university had to believe in them, had to trust them, had to except that they were aware and capable of gathering this knowledge. And this was reflected that the universities don't have this reciprocal trust, actually. A number of them mentioned that they would not be looking to engage students as part of their crisis response. They wouldn't be using student ambassadors to ensure people were aware of the problems, that they were engaging with the problems. So if we look on to the practitioner findings linking with this, a message that came through is that they actually had social media capabilities, but these were an add-on. This was another tool in their armory. It wasn't a way to change their thinking. It wasn't a way to drive new communication strategies, but it was just another channel that they had to go out there. As this university mentioned, they have email, they use social media, they have a free phone number, they use posters, they have communications ambassadors who were staff members, not student members. Social media was just another piece of the jigsaw, essentially. But actually, they preferred a measured re re response in general, and they had a preference, as students did, for email communications and tried and tested technologies. Social media just wasn't proven to the universities as a way of engaging with the students. As I've mentioned, a number of them had the social media capability, but it was a marketing tool. It was a way to engage with students and sell the brand and get recruitment figures up. It wasn't a way to communicate with current students and send messages out to them. And despite some interest in text messaging from students and a number of the universities m mentioned that they were interested in the idea of being able to send text messaging, there was very limited um, relevance, uh, sorry, very limited capability amongst the universities. I think two at the time actually had the capability. And one of the concerns was, well, students are just changing their telephone numbers all the time. We're never going to keep on, touch of it. on top of this. One university actually um, was much more proactive and tried to capture telephone numbers at the point of uh, the start of a crisis. So they'd send a message via the, the web and then ask people to, to send in their, their numbers so they had the most up-to-date number. But everyone had a preference for email and web communication, so there seemed to be a synergy between expectations between the students and the university. Universities that did use social media only used it as a dissemination tool. They didn't use it as a way to capture information. So much like the police now will um, use Twitter as a way to understand what's going on, on the ground and to try and gather information, the universities didn't see this capability as something that they could harness. But they did see it as a good way to spread messages. And one saying, you know, access 10% of students via social media and it's going to spread. So I'll pass over to Tina to give us some conclusion. So what became clear in terms of our study was that there's a wide range of different media use, different communication channels. 
but that these are being added to rather than universities thinking about the nature of social media and the nature of this demographic of the student body and the way in which the student body accesses and utilise different information sources, different forms of social media. So rather than, if you like, shaking their existing mental model about effective communication processes, they were really just adding on within that existing kind of mental model. Um, so as a result, social media is not yet in a position to play a pivotal uh, role in crisis communication. What was interesting to note as well in terms of this was that universities, higher education institutions, did engage with social media. But when you looked at what they actually did through social media and what they were seeking to achieve through social media, it was largely around marketing and recruitment of students. So if you were to think about it in terms of marketing terminology, you might say that it was very much a transactional kind of focus. The transaction being the recruitment of the student, the student coming to the university, and then some material to actually reflect to show that students are having a good time, but the focus was very much upon that transaction by and large, rather than longer term customer relationship management. And that's particularly key, I think, in terms of one of the key kind of elements that we'd emphasise coming out of this research, is a failure to, for institutions to think about social capital, and social capital in terms of their student body that without building relationships with their students and social media offering a very powerful way in which to hook into student networks and students' networks and to build relationships which facilitate trust, which facilitate information exchanges and reciprocity. Without doing that, the effective use of social media in terms of crisis response is inherently limited. Um, students had a preference for email and website communications and it was difficult to unpick in terms of the study whether this was a bit of chicken and egg, whether it was because this was the way in which the university tended to communicate with them, that was what they were used to and therefore that was fine, or whether it was because they had concerns just as the university had concerns about areas of control and ambits of interest. So one ambit of interest, my social media, activities are largely around my wider life rather than my work, my university work. Um, from the practitioner point of view, there was this perception that students had a never-ending stream of changing preferences and changing phone numbers and so forth, and therefore there was a reluctance to engage in trying to understand and become part of that process. At the same time, when you spoke to practitioners about this and you'd ask them from where they got this sense, they weren't able to present it. Um, and in terms of the business continuity practitioners, there was a wide range in terms of our sample of 12 male and female, but they were primarily older than their 18 to 34 demographic as well. So there's a question about their own use of social media and their preferences. Urgency was a key factor in terms of the different scenarios that were presented to students. Again, different time urgency, increased student preference for the use of social media for text messaging, but at that time, only a small number of institutions had such facilities. And that brought us to one of the key constraints the practitioners saw. In addition to their concerns about the potential for social media acting as a mechanism or a tool for escalation and amplifying a problem, a threat, a potential disruption, they were also, every single one of them pretty much talked about the resource constraints within which they were operating. And that to engage effectively in social media required a level of resource, both technical and human in terms of the skills and expertise and time needed to, to operate that. And I think this final issue, um, which is really the key one, was this notion, again getting back to this idea of social capital, that there was, if you like, in terms of characterising information, the perspective adopted by both the students and the practitioners was very much about unidirectional information, unidirectional communication that practitioners saw social media as one more tool, potentially, to get information out there. Students saw social media as one more tool that they might get information. But rather than, as effective crisis management would, would suggest, and there's data to indicate that effective crisis management is based upon a communication process with feedback loops whereby information 
both goes out but comes back in in an iterative process whereby then the message can be refined and changed and amended according to changing perceptions within <coughs> stakeholder groups as it was from both the student point of view and the practitioner point of view the unidirectionality really meant that that wasn't that wasn't the case thank you <laughs>